Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Jewel Podcast. My name is Craig O'Donoghue from the West Australian Newspaper, taking you through another season of talking to guests from the Perth Wildcats, Perth Lynx and WA Basketball in general to give you the best insight possible into what's happening in the sport throughout this state. And isn't a week a long time in sport? Last week I said it was likely to be the last episode of Dribble Podcast for the season, but left the door ajar to keep covering key issues in depth if we needed to do so, and now we have key issues. So, in this week's episode we'll be joined by Perth Lynx Vice Captain Lauren Scherf as her team prepares for a game which will decide whether their final chances are alive or dead. And then we'll hear from Basketball WA Deputy CEO Evan Stewart and City of Stirling Mayor Mark Irwin about the crucial issue surrounding noise from outdoor basketball rings. But first, Oh my god, look up in the sky! Yes, finals have come early for Perth Lynx and one woman who'll be central to the team trying to make the top four will be star centre and vice captain Super Lauren Scherf. Super Scherf, welcome back to the Dribble Podcast. Thank you for having me again. So let's cut right to the chase. It's do or die this week, isn't it? It is. Yeah, there's no better way of putting it. (laughs) So take the listeners right into the ladder. The Lynx play Bendigo at the Bendat Basketball Centre on Saturday night. If Perth win, they draw level with the Spirit on 11 wins, but more importantly, they win their three-game series 2-1, meaning if they're tied at the end of the regular season, the Lynx will get the highest spot on the ladder. Lose, Bendigo go to 12 wins, claim the series, and know that it's impossible for them to be knocked over by the Lynx no matter what happens for the rest of the season. So it's an elimination final come early. What's it feel like internally for the group? Yeah, we're all in really good spirits. We're, you know, got a headset on this upcoming game. We're just really looking forward to what this game's going to bring. And, you know, especially being at home, it's going to be even better for the fans. So we're all just locked in. We're all, you know, confident and just ready to go. So, yeah, we're excited. You've had a few opportunities in recent weeks to get these extra wins you need to jump above the spirit. You had the two against Townsville. You had the one against Southside on the weekend, and they haven't really worked out. How are you handling it from a leadership perspective to get everyone focused, settled, and probably settled to be the main word, I reckon, because you haven't been looking like a settled team lately? We're just keeping everyone in good spirits, just, you know, keeping confidence levels up, uh, just making sure that everyone's on the same page, especially because when we're all on the same page and we all know what we bring to a team and what we're doing, it just flows a lot better. Uh, and just, you know, focusing on us, not being too worried about what the opposition does and what they bring, obviously, like knowing what they can do and everything, but ultimately just just doing us and what we bring as a team because we know that we can be bloody great. So I think just, you know, having the confidence to bring what we do to the floor and just playing our style of basketball. You can be bloody great. There's no doubt about that. And if you reflect on the games against Bendigo, I think it's been a classic this year. You lost 85-66 in the second game of the season when you were still trying to work out what was going on as a group. And you shot a bit like me. You were 5 from 28 from three-point range, although I'd be worse, and 38% from the field overall. Then you shot like yourselves on January 25, 40% from the perimeter, 40% overall, and you dominate that game and win. Is it as simple as if you guys shoot well, you win, and if you shoot crap, you lose? <laughs> Well, it looks like that, but um, no, we just, you know, we know that when somebody's off or someone's not working, you know, other people step up and that's like the value of what this team brings, that someone's always going to step up in um, different games and I think just having so many different calibre of shooters on our team, you know, it just really helps camaraderie and the style of play that we have and we're a three-point shooting team and that's what Ryan has designed this team around and we're always going to put up threes so we do and die by the three-point line. And Chloe Bibby certainly lived and died by the three-point line the other day against Adelaide, five and a quarter, uh, seven for the game. And we've seen you've gone nuts in a couple of games this year. Amy Atwell's gone nuts in a couple of games. Sammy Wickham's gone nuts in a couple of games. So do you feel like all it takes is one of you to have that big game and the entire match goes in your favour? It does a bit, yeah. I mean, if we could all just be on the same page for one game, my gosh, I don't know what would happen. But, um, yeah, like, it just takes one of us to get our eye in and then we're sweet. So we just, like, got to get the ball in their hands and, you know, when someone's hot, we just got to keep going to them. And I think that's just what, like I said before, the style of play that Ryan has built, it is based on three-point shooters and, and it just fits in everybody's game. So I think, you know, when one person's on, we just have to, yeah, really use them and really make sure that we keep going back to them to make sure that they're still hot. 
Starts have been a bit of an issue in several games this year, especially in the last couple. Is there anything you can do to change the way you prepare for those five minutes before a game or whether it's half an hour before the game where you work through different things? Is there an area which you may have spoken about already where you think we can just tinker with that a little bit? I think just throwing like the first punch, almost like being the first team to come out there and, you know, really throw the other team off guard. Um, We've had games where we've done that and it's put us in a good stead for the rest of the game. So I think that just going in with like a positive and confident mindset of we having the ability and we believe in what we've done throughout the week and, you know, we've believed in what the coaches have given us and just you know having that sense of that we want to do this and we want to make finals and like you know we want to win the championship at the end of the day so I think that it's just like that want and you know wanting to play and wanting to win um yeah so we have done it before and I'm sure we can do it this game so we just have to put our mindsets to it so that comes down to desperation doesn't it the want to win Ryan mentioned that after the game he thought Southside on the weekend started with a little bit more desperation what to, what type of group do you have it looks like a fairly laid back squad which is really which gets along really well is it a sort of laid back sort of team or is it a group that really enjoys a rocket like how do you um, find <laughs> this group responds to different elements of the way Ryan can coach whether it's calm Ryan or, or up and about angry Ryan no like the camaraderie between the team is like really good um I mean, like, obviously when things don't go our way, we reassess and we look back on what we could have learned and, like, what we could have done better. And I think just being accountable for what we've done in the past and and then bringing into the next game, being like, right, well, I don't want to do that again, so I'm going to make sure that I just be there for my teammate or, you know, on defense or just, like, certain little things. And just taking pride in what we do is, um, I think, is a massive one for us. You mentioned all the shooters that you have within this group. It's an amazing team when you look at it statistically. You rank second for average score this season. You rank sixth for defence, but you also clearly lead the league for shots, which means that you play at a faster pace and the opposition gets more shots. So you're going to be high score, they're going to be high score. So it can be hard to work out whether your defence is good or bad from a statistical point of view. How do you handle run-ons from in games when you know that the way you play is going to be high pace, high scoring, and they're going to get some high scores too? Um, I don't really think about that, to be honest. I just like, I just love the style of play. So I enjoy playing in it. So I can only just imagine when it looks great on floor, it probably looks great to watch. Um, so when it's feeling really high pace and it's going real quick, but to us, like that's normal. <laughs> um, we, we try and push the ball and we want to try and get as much transition as we can. And, and it's fun to play. So we just like... Yeah, so, I mean, I haven't, like, yeah, didn't really think about that, but I can only just imagine when we're on, it looks bloody great to watch. Um, But, yeah, like, we don't really think too much about what the opposition try and does. We just try and, you know, play our game and play our strategy, and that is obviously fast-paced basketball. And we just try and, like, score more, (laughs) I guess, if you could say the best way to put it, yeah. Certainly sums it up, doesn't it? Especially the way you play, because... Let's have a listen. You have had a massive season. Kicks it back out to Scherf to get her scoring underway. He then gives it to Scherf, who steps out for three from the corner. Back to Scherf. Wants another three. She stepped out, and now she's making it rain. To Scherf. Not another three. Oh, my God. Yes, you can certainly shoot the damn ball, and it's clear teams are putting <laughs> some uh, hell of a lot of time into you at the moment. They know that you can shoot from three, that you can get the ball to the rim, and you can also do a hell of a lot of work with your passing. How are you finding the extra time that is clear the teams are now targeting you a lot harder than what they were in the past? Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I haven't even really um, picked up on it. I go into each game knowing what I can do and what I can bring and whatever the team needs me to do at that point, like, I will do it. So if the three-point shooting comes, like, yes, I will obviously put up a three because who doesn't love putting up threes? But if my team needs me to rebound or they need me to have their back on defense, blocking shots for them, or, you know, trying to, like, get back on offense, trying to look for the open passes there, like, that's what I'm here to do. And I want to get the ball in people's hands. I want them to be able to score. So that's, like, my most important thing is just trying to get other people in the game, knowing that they feel like that they're a part of the team. And so um, I haven't really, like taken too much notice about the opposition and you know what the opposition try and does to me because like in every game like I just know like I'm just trying to do what's best for my team and if that's what the defense wants to do is be more hard on me then I'm going to try and get everyone else open so 
yeah, so it's kind of like that. Like, I don't really think too much about what the opposition is trying to do to stop me. <laughs> so what I find really interesting about this team this year is you're not as stacked as what a lot of the teams are. You lost two WNBA stars last year, Marina Mabry and Jackie Young, who were freakishly good, plus a World Cup Opal and your captain, Darcy Garvin. And you've replaced them with clearly talented players, but a different level of experience. It's effectively Jackie for Robbie Ryan, uh, Marina for Amy Atwell, and Darcy for Chloe Bibby. So two players straight out of college and one who's been over here playing... Uh, NBL One West, but despite that, you're still in finals contention. It's a fair effort. Do you look at it and sometimes think, you know, this team has come together in unique circumstances without the absolute stardom from America, and you're still one win away from getting back into that top four? Uh, I like. I always knew what those girls could bring. I didn't doubt them for a second like what they could do and what talent they could bring I always knew what Chloe Bibby brought I always knew what Amy Atwell and Robbie Ryan and so like their skill sets they fit perfectly with what Ryan's style of play is so I think like it was a really good fit for the three of them um, just with the style of play that we have it's fast paced it's three point shooting it's a lot of transition and everything so I think that they've fit in really well and I think that's why we're in finals contention is because the way they've slotted in so well to the style of play, like Ryan got them for a reason. So Ryan has worked around their style of basketball to fit in with what he wants us to play like. So I'm really proud of all three of them and the way that they've conducted themselves throughout the season. And they've all got bright futures ahead of them and can't wait to see what the future brings for them. Ryan's done an amazing job with this group, hasn't he? As I said, it was stacked last year and he got the absolute most out of that team. He's getting the absolute most out of this team again right now. He's a fair coach, isn't he? (laughs) He really is, to say the least. I mean, he goes out for the players that what they can do and what talent they bring. Like, he doesn't have, like, a set structure and then tries to have the players fit into that structure. He has the structure fit into the players that he has so he's always like trying to figure out ways of people trying to score and everything so he really tries to mold the offense around the players and I think that's just what helps us play so well. We all know how it finished last year with being so close to winning a championship that Marina maybe missed free throw at the end of the second game of the series, which could have sent the game to overtime, could have won the championship, could have, would have, should have, is always an amazing part of sport. But what I found interesting is that the, the players who have returned this year are combined shooting 10% better at free throws than what they did last season. And they weren't, they weren't bad last season, but they've certainly gone up um, to a higher level this year. I think you're up by 15% this year. Was there an approach towards the free throw line during the offseason of we're never letting that happen again? If we get the opportunity, we're just sinking the damn ball. <laughs> um, I tried not to think about that too much, but um, obviously if we're shooting better from the free throw line, obviously it's saying something, but obviously we don't put too much emphasis on uh, the series last season as this is a completely new team, different players, different people. Obviously, you know, the goal is still the same, but at the end of the day, like, yeah, you just got to make the shot. So I think that we don't put too much emphasis on too many things and we just play the way that we want to play and if it goes in it goes in if it doesn't we got to get the rebound so <laughs> and that's what you're good at <laughs> <laughs> so yes last game for the season obviously at home uh, really important for your fans to have an opportunity to watch you play in the regular season that last regular season game at home at least we're assuming that you'll make the finals but how important is it for your fans to be able to get out there this week 6 30 p.m saturday night perfect timing for them uh, to be able to come watch you in what is effectively a final Yeah, I mean, like, it's not one to miss, that's for sure. Um, It's going to be a brilliant game. It's going to be high pace, fast pace. It's going to be loud. It's going to be intense. So, I mean, you wouldn't want to miss this, especially for Perth basketball fanatics. So, I mean, I would get down there. Yeah, it's going to be one to to watch. I know it's going to be on everyone's, pinned in everyone's schedule to watch. So, yeah, I'm excited to play it, be a part of it. So, yeah, you wouldn't want to miss it, that's for sure. Absolutely. So 6.30pm, Saturday night, Perth Lynx versus Bendigo Spirit. Massive, massive game. Thank you very much for your time, Lauren. Really appreciate it always. Uh, you've been a pleasure to deal with and you've been lots of fun to watch this year as well. So good luck on the weekend. Hopefully it goes well for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me again. 
Now, there is a massive issue for basketball in this state at the moment following the Department of Water and Environment Regulation releasing a paper for discussion surrounding the noise levels of outdoor basketball rings. Essentially, any court or pad less than 6 by 6 metres in size cannot be closer than 30 to 50 metres from a house near a major road, and that distance extends to 60 to 90 metres if the road doesn't carry 15,000 cars per day. If you want to build a bigger court, such as a half court, it's minimum 60 to 90 metres if near a major road, and 100 to 150 metres on a normal road. Basketball WA firmly opposes these moves, and Deputy CEO Evan Stewart joins me now to discuss. Evan, welcome. Thanks, Craig. How are you? I'm going well, but this is not ideal, is it? (laughs) It's certainly not ideal. Um, It's a major issue for our youth and for our sport, to be honest with you. Um, We're obviously continue to grow, and we're a, a really popular sport, and it's really... Um, attractive for for young people to to be involved in in our sport but if these guidelines come into place it's going to be really really difficult for outdoor courts of all kinds including full courts and house courts and pads to be available for our youth to play on it's an interesting report and it comes down to trust as well i think when you look at it it says this is only going to apply for new facilities but i think what we know is once you get the new facility in in terms of the terminology of what's allowed the old facility gets targeted is that your biggest concern that it's fine for them to say one thing but it's going to edge towards other facilities being closed down for being too close to housing yeah, I mean, the reality is, and we continue to work with local governments on exactly how it will affect them, but from the data we have so far, it's 75 to 85% of courts that are currently in existence would not meet the guidelines. And the reality is they are guidelines about how to try and overcome the noise regulations. So if someone makes a complaint about an existing court, then... The fact that they're saying that these guidelines don't apply is irrelevant. The noise regulations say that it is too noisy when you're within those distances from a house. Our argument is that the benefit for our youth and the benefits to society of kids playing in our local parks, which is what they're for, should override the noise regulations. Do you feel there will be some areas which will suffer more than others in terms of locations with um, the amount of money people have or with the amount of courts that exist? Yeah, look, the outcome of something like this is that, you know, in, let's say, the more higher socioeconomic background families will just put hoops in their driveway, which creates more noise in those neighbourhoods, in houses everywhere, because they can afford to put a hoop in their driveway because kids want to play and that's, that's... what we need but in lower socioeconomic areas uh, a lot of the kids go to the local park because they don't have a hoop in their driveway and a lot of programs run by you know Edmund Rice and Coya and different companies are, are actually for, for low socioeconomic kids are actually being run in local parks and those courts may not be there in the future. Now, we've got a hoop in our backyard, and we've got one just down the road as well. My son prefers to go to the one down the road rather than shoot in the backyard um, because it looks better and you can shoot from a greater distance and all that sort of stuff. But it's all, I reckon it's the one in the backyard is really noisy, and the one that we shoot at elsewhere isn't. Like, do you you think that some people don't really get it that if you push kids away from the park, they're just going to be right next door to you? And those portable ones, they do make a racket. Uh, yeah, look, I agree with that. It's just that you, it's harder to complain about noise in, in with your neighbour um, than it is to complain about noise in the local park. So, um, you know, because of the regulations. So, yes, I agree that the, the noise can be very annoying um, of someone right next door and especially so as we become more urban and backyards become smaller and houses are closer together. So I think the park's play a role in actually allowing our kids to to walk down to a park and play with their friends in the park in an environment that it's meant to be. Do you feel basketball gets unfairly targeted? Because I don't really hear these sorts of complaints from other sports. And a cricket ball can smash a car window really easily, but uh, if the siren from footy is really, really loud and the whistle from the, from the field umpire goes off every every couple of seconds. You know, the tennis ball is being whacked around all day long, and but it feels like that it's a basketball issue more than other sports when these complaints start getting laid. Yeah, look, I... I think it's a complex problem, but but certainly it's the bouncing ball that uh, people will 
will go to as that's the problem. Um, but I think there are issues in in local communities around these, you know, all sports. Um, as you said, you know, kicking the ball into the backyard, breaking the neighbour's window, all these things happen and there's always people complaining. I think, you know, basketball has become more and more popular and that's, you know, that most, a lot of the parks were set up for the kids. There's swings, there's uh, things that kids want to do, but not what youth want to do. And as we try and activate those parks for youth, it is basketball and skateboarding and different things that they want to do. And people are concerned about youth congregating in their local neighbourhood. It's great if they congregate, but not next to us. Um, and I think the noise is is part of that. Certainly it is a noisy thing, but it's a way of actually being able to push people away from from our neighbourhood. So what are you asking for? When you when you put your submission in arguing against these regulations being passed, what do you want to happen? So we believe that the regulations, like there's exemptions in the regulations for garbage trucks. You know, there's exemptions in the regulations for you having a party until midnight in your house. There's exemptions. You know, they, they made exemptions for small bars in, in local communities so that we could have small bars in in neighbourhoods, um, which go against the noise regulations. But we're not we're not apparently looking at an exemption for kids being able to play in the park. So certainly our submission is to say the guidelines that they've generated show how how silly it is if we don't have an exemption. Basically, there will be no basketball or youth playing in parks because it, there's only about five percent of parks where you could. And we need, for the benefit of those kids and for the benefit that they get out of playing with their friends in, in the local parks, we need to exempt the noise and say that you know, maybe between daylight hours you know, or between 7am and, and 6pm that people are allowed to play in parks and you can't complain about the noise because that's what parks are for. You must have been overwhelmed by the reaction from people in the past 24 hours since we had the story in the West Australian. Like People have come out in support of the sport from all over the place and shown what it means for people to be able to play sport outside and have fun. Yeah, certainly the overwhelming majority are surprised that, um, <laughs> that we would be even considering stopping kids playing in the park. But, you know, a lot of those people don't live next to a park either. So... I do get the balance and we do have to understand that there is an, a noise issue, but we need to find a balance that allows our kids to have the right to play what they want to do in a local park so that we're, they're being active and they're not shut down. And I think that's certainly part of the overwhelming reaction is we don't want kids inside playing on computer games. We don't want them shut out of, of these things. We want them to be active and we want them to have positive things to do in our community and I think this is an example where we've just got to think through how to best do that. The boys under 20 team from WA had a fair weekend over in the national championships winning the title which was absolutely massive for the state. I reckon some of them would have played outside of a fair portion of their lives as well. How big a week was it for everyone to be watching that happening? Uh, yeah, look, it was amazing. Um, you know, we, we went over there thinking we were a chance to win but yeah, it's it's a long way from thinking you can win to actually putting it in place. So certainly everyone in the office was following every game and watching as much as we could and uh, they had a great, great week and that's amazing for Western Australian basketball and all goes well for for the future of some of those young kids getting hopefully into the Wildcats and, and progressing their basketball careers. Ben Henshaw will be one of those guys, wins the Bob Staunton medal as the male player of the championships. It's an exciting story, isn't it? especially considering he's going off to the Boomers camp this week as well. It's a great week for him. I mean, we've got those guys played as a group with Luke Travers and Dukas and those guys, and some have gone off to college and some are playing for the Wildcats already, and now some have been through the system, the AIS system, and are ready to take the next step, and that's awesome. There's a great group of talent, and we certainly hope that you know we can keep them in Western Australia and play for the Wildcats and progress their careers or that they have a career somewhere else. But it's great to see them progressing and, and playing so well. Oh, it's fantastic for him, it's fantastic for the team, it's fantastic for basketball in this state. Keep pushing hard on the noise issue, it's bloody ridiculous, I think. Um, and it's a key issue for kids who want to have fun, so uh, you're doing a great job pushing this forward, and uh, we'll continue talking to people throughout the rest of this episode. Thanks, Greg, I appreciate your support.
Now, there have been plenty of stories in recent years about councils siding with residents when complaints have been laid about this issue. And since 2019, we can look at the town of Victoria Park, City of South Perth, City of Gosnells, Shire of Dalyallup and City of Joondalup, who have all either removed rings, added restrictions or scrapped plans to build a ring due to the noise complaints or concerns. But one man who is standing up for basketball in this issue is the City of Stirling Mayor, Mark Irwin. Mayor Irwin, welcome to the Dribble Podcast. Thanks for having me. Now, you're in charge of a big area that includes 29 outdoor basketball facilities. Do you know how many of those would breach the guidelines? Yeah, so out of the current 29 across the City of Stirling, 100 square kilometres, about 230,000 residents, only 12%. So 25 out of the 29 would not be compliant with these regulations. That's a huge number. Like, So how concerned are you if these rules come through? Look, um, I'm not ultra concerned because I think there is opportunity now for consultation. I guess the reason for us jumping in behind Basketball WA is to say that when guidelines like this are first thought up, I think it really needs significant research and ensure that we don't go and try to legislate straight away to the lowest common denominator. This. There's an opportunity or there was an opportunity to consult heavily with Basketball WA, with Parks and Leisure Australia and all those other um, organisations that deal with recreation and leisure rather than just go to those planning guidelines and particularly local government authorities who have to administer and deal with their residents on a daily basis. So why do you feel that there wasn't more research done and more people spoken to around this? Is it purely just, well, noise is noise and we're just going to focus on noise? Yeah, and I think when you look at anything that um, is in relation to uh, compliance, so if you look at DWER and, and coming in from that angle of compliance and the noise complaints they receive, it's really easy just to put rules around um, protecting residents' amenity, and I get that that's an important part. But the reality on the ground is there's so many other factors. You know, we deal with compliance for a number of items throughout City of Stirling with air conditioners, with um, generators, car noise, all those sorts of things. And often it's hard to separate one level of noise out of all the different noises that occur. The classics is all our parks and recreation reserves. They're beautiful during the week, but a kids' sporting games on the weekend with whistles and coaches yelling, you know, it does create that, that minimal impact at certain times. I think what's important here is we look at what is currently working. And if you looked at our local government authority, for example, whilst we do receive complaints, the reality is those 29 basketball rings are now providing amenity for the residents and they're providing an opportunity for thousands of kids to get out on weekends and recreate and have fun. Which is what it's all about, isn't it? I don't live in your council, but I did previously. I lived directly opposite Grenville Reserve in Tewart Hill, which has two tennis courts, a brick wall for people to hit the tennis ball against, a basketball ring, a playground, and a footy oval where games were played. And there was never a single time where I felt aggrieved by the noise. Uh, do you get frustrated by the complaints of people who would buy a property opposite a park that's got facilities for people to have fun with and then say it's too noisy because they're having fun? Oh, look, I th- it's, it's hard. I don't necessarily get frustrated or annoyed because I do get it. I, I do get it. We've all got our bugbears and there's nothing worse if it's if it's something that is just incessant and it's, you know, that bouncing noise all the time. But there's ways for us to mitigate that. And I think it's about looking at it, understanding if someone is just, you know, doesn't want any noise or if they're actually being reasonable and saying, hey, you know, I don't mind having a basketball ring opposite, but is there something you can do to make it better for me? Um, and we can work through those things. I think one of the problems with just putting in straight guidelines that restrict distances, uh, put extra conditions on the sort of turfing. Quite often there's minimal changes with that, but it does affect where those basketball rings are located. And it doesn't take into account all those other things we look at as a local government, like ensuring that they're next to walkable catchments, close to um, other facilities that may already exist, um, accessible for kids and parents or people with disabilities to be able to access the fact that we've got more and more subdivisions occurring in the neighbourhoods and quite often smaller recreation places. So when you put in just standard guidelines around that, it doesn't take into account all those other things that impact. And I think it's, it's really important we look at how we can increase physical participation. I, I get out and about, as do all of our local um, elected members on the weekends and see the amount of sport and the engagement we currently have. It is phenomenal. And we've got to make sure we encourage that. Our big reserves are quite often very busy with organised sport. And so those smaller reserves, the ones that sometimes are classed as local reserves or local parks, are the ones that we need to have these um, recreation facilities on. 
So the document itself says there's some suggestions there for how new courts can be built or located for pads and things like that. One of them says build it behind a toilet block because it can absorb the noise. Another one says use perforated backboards and things like that. And it also says there's an opportunity to build fences around it. I look at it and go, build it near a toilet block, safety concerns, build it with a fence around it, vandalism concerns. Are some of these things that are raised as solutions going to create more headaches? I think that's the the part of it that needs to be heavily consulted with the people who regulate it. So as you've just identified, you know, we get more complaints about public toilet blocks that are disused or being used for the wrong purposes and, you know, appear dirty. It's to then try to put basketball rings behind them. Uh, We talk about our design right throughout our public realm, um, including things called SEPTEP, which is crime prevention through environmental design. And that's about passive surveillance, ensuring um, they're used, you know, so playgrounds are near other sporting facilities, uh, they're not hidden behind bushes. or So a lot of these things have those unintended consequences. Uh, the prohibitive nature of, of including things like AstroTurf, hundreds of thousands of dollars to AstroTurf these sort of facilities, probably with minimal um, changes to the noise impact, I would suggest. Uh, but also the ongoing maintenance and especially for smaller local governments, it could result in it just being easier not to do them and that's not what we want to see. Will you be writing a submission arguing against the changes? Yeah, we'll certainly have a look at them. I know our team's already um, been engaging with Basketball WA and certainly through our planning team um, and our recreation team, we'll provide as much comment as we can. I I don't think D were um, trying to do the wrong thing here. I, I see why they're trying to do it, but it's important we ensure that we don't provide regulations that create an unintended consequence. So one of those is, whilst these guidelines are predominantly designed for new basketball courts, what will happen is we see us review our um, local parks or the equipment in our local parks. If we try to maybe refurbish one of these, it might then trigger that development application or the, the next stage where it does have to comply with these and we have to remove it. And that's not what we want to see in our parks. We also don't want to see basketball rings closed down and more and more just people will use their driveways. And obviously that's going to create those unintended consequences with the neighbours. Uh, it's important we also look at how local government achieves their parks hierarchy. So some of the terminology in a consultation paper like this talks about a local park. It could mean different things for different local governments. Well, I do love the fact that you're a sporting mayor. It's good to see a mayor who looks after the sporting side of life. So I really appreciate your time. And I think everyone who is involved in basketball will be really happy to hear um, what you've had to say today and backing the sport. So thank you very much for coming on to the Dribble Podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure. And, and hopefully something really good comes out of this. The discussion will be a good one. Uh, and maybe it will highlight how we can better assist to uh, you know, make basketball and other sports more accessible you know we one of the things we're looking at at the moment is even engaging more with our schools there's fantastic facilities that are quite often now um, not accessible on a weekend and and are in the perfect location so there's plenty of opportunities here i love that idea well look thanks for your time you have a good day i know it's a busy one for you thanks for having me Well, that's it. But before I finish, good luck to Wildcats pair Mitch Norton and Todd Blanchfield, who will compete for Australia uh, in the Boomers games this week. Uh, It's a weakened Aussie squad than usual, uh, given a lot of players are still playing in the NBA or uh, playing in the NBL finals and all those sorts of things. But a big happy anniversary to Bryce Cotton, given February 22 is two years since he received his Distinguished Talent visa. I'm sure you can sense the irony in my voice around that. Just make the bloke an Australian citizen and maybe he could have walked out there with his teammates and worn the green and gold and played in those matches when they were desperately looking for some superstars to play in that game. So that's it for this week's episode of the Dribble Podcast. Thank you to Lauren Scherf, Evan Stewart and Mayor Mark Irwin for their time. Thanks to Kate Ryan for her production work. You can continue to read all of your basketball news in the West Australian newspaper and at thewest.com.au. Look forward to speaking to you again when we next record the Dribble Podcast.